that we can look around it we can see people bigger stronger smarter than we are have more opportunity than we have but in the one way that we are all born equal is in matters of courage each of us can have all that we want you can't use it up it's the key to success it's the key to freedom Go ahead, you, t you can take the second seat there, sir. All right. That's good. Grab the other two. Good morning, folks. Welcome to Warburton Review on, uh, yeah, it's Friday now. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we have a great program, as you can tell, and Connie is, oh, she's just moving a chair. Okay, that's fine. Um, I looked at the program that we've got today, and, and I had great difficulty in, in, in how I was going to orchestrate it. Um, I'm Ed McElhinney. Yeah, I'm a retired fighter pilot, um, and I got helicopters behind me. So it's, it's going to be difficult for me, but uh, please bear with me today. Um, but we are in the midst here of, of uh, a hero, and I, I can't, I, I don't know how many of you know General Brady's story, I guess is the best way to put it, um, but uh, I, I feel obligated to let everybody know exactly uh, what went on so many years ago. I, as a retired general officer also, I presented many medals and awards myself, um, and typically they started with attention to order. So bear with me for a minute, and I will say attention to order. For conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity in action at the risk of his life above and beyond the call of duty, Major Brady distinguished himself while serving in the Republic of Vietnam commanding a UH-1H ambulance helicopter. He volunteered to rescue wounded men from a site in enemy-held territory which was supported to be heavily defended and to be blanketed by fog. To reach the site, he descended through heavy fog and smoke and hovered slowly along the valley trail turning a ship sideward to blow the fog away with a backwash from his rotor blades. Despite the unchallenged close-range enemy fire, he found the dangerously small site where he successfully landed and evacuated two badly wounded South Vietnamese soldiers. He was then called to another area completely covered by dense fog where American casualties lay only 50 meters from the enemy. Two aircraft had been previously shot down and others had made unsuccessful attempts to reach this site earlier in the day. With unmatched skill and extraordinary courage, Major Brady made four flights to this embattled landing zone and successfully rescued all the wounded. On his third mission of the day, Major Brady once again landed at a site surrounded by the enemy. The friendly ground force pinned down by enemy fire had been unable to reach and secure the landing zone. Although his aircraft had been badly damaged and his controls partially shot away during his initial entry into this area, he returned minutes later and returned the remaining injured. 
Shortly thereafter, obtaining a replacement aircraft, Major Brady was requested to land in an enemy minefield where a platoon of American soldiers was trapped. A mine detonated near his helicopter, wounding two crew members and damaging his ship. In spite of this, he managed to fly six severely injured patients to medical aid. Throughout that day, Major Brady utilized three helicopters to evac uh, evacuate a total of 51 seriously wounded men, many of whom would have perished without prompt medical treatment. Major Brady's bravery was in highest traditions of the military service and reflects great credit upon himself and the United States Army. This is the man who is here. Stay down. Okay. Stay down. That's fine. That's fine. <clears throat> I had to do that. I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, now you all know that part of the story. And there's much more after that. He made a comment. He said, you know, he said, what was it in, in the book? You said it, earning the Medal of Honor you thought was sometimes easier than wearing it. And that's an interesting comment. We'll talk about that later. But as we go on, you can see we got two beautiful airplanes, uh, excuse me, aircraft here. I, uh, yeah, I'm a fighter pilot, okay. Um, a UH-1H, uh, and we got the Sikorsky over here. We got the owners uh, both here. We've got uh, Dave Schmitz, um, who's going to be talking a little bit about the UH-1 later, and uh, Mike Schneider, and he's got the Sikorsky. We'll be talking about that later. The sequence of events, I think we're going to talk to General Brady for a little bit here, and then we're going to talk about each of the other airplanes. We'll do a quick walk around, um, and then we'll open it up to questions. So uh, that's what I propose, and, uh, and with that, General Brady, I'm going to open it up to you and, uh, and just say, I, I have a thousand questions. He's got a book, by the way, and there's going to be a signing later in the, uh, the uh, museum or in the, uh, the bookstore over there. Um, and uh, I've read the book. Um, interesting, interesting stories. Um, and you flew dust off. Um, tell us a little bit about the mission. The, uh, do we got, I know we've got a lot of v uh, Vietnam veterans here. Uh, from Vietnam, right? Raise your hand, guys. I, I know there's quite a few here. Uh, any of you ever picked up by dust off? Yeah, here we go. Good. Well, that, it was it, it. The story, much of the story, is in my uh, in the book about the origins of dust off and how, how successful it was and the techniques we used to get into the battlefield. And so I always usually start with a war story. It kind of tells you what we did. You all know the difference between a war story and a fairy tale. A war story, a fairy tale begins with once upon a time, and a war story begins with this is no shit. <laughs> so we were, and we were called out one day to kind of give you an idea to a pickup site uh, in a combat area. Uh, the people on the ground were wounded Marines. And as is always the case with the Marines, there's a lot of confusion down there. <laughs> Got some Marines here. I don't want you to think I'm saying anything disparaging about another service, but for you Marines, disparaging is bad. <laughs> so if you've ever uh, been in a deal, you got... We got a dry riverbed here. You got kind of a tree line here. You got an open rice paddy and surrounded by trees here. And the enemy is in this tree line. And the patients are here. And the friendlies are here. And so I'm flying with this young warrant officer and uh, made a nice approach into the area. We dropped down into the riverbed, scoot along behind the trees, jumped up over the trees, turned our tail into the fire. You always did that. You did not want the bullets to come through the windshield. Better that they came through the transmission. So you always did that, and you went out the same way that you came in. Well, if you've ever been in a situation like that where they're crawling around, nobody will stand up, and they're shouting and shooting, and it's just a mess, you know what it's like to pucker. And pucker is when the cheeks from the lower part of your body slowly begin to envelop your ears. 
And so we're sitting there all puckered up, and you also try to shrink yourself. You just try to become just as small as you can. And you're sitting up here, and everybody's crawling around down here. And so we're shrunk up, we're puckered, and I look over at my co-pilot, and his head's going like this all over the cockpit. I thought that's strange. Strange guy. Back to the patients. Let's get him on. Let's get the heck out of here. And then back to my buddy, and there his head is like that. And I couldn't help myself. I broke down. I laughed out loud. And he didn't miss a stroke. He said, laugh, you son of a bitch, but it's harder to hit a moving target. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a true story. <clears throat> By the way, that pilot, if you heard the story about the guy who confiscated a Huey and tried to fly it into the White House, he was the Maryland State Patrol helicopter pilot that got between that, that helicopter and the White House. We looked for him for years. We thought he was killed in an under, underground drug thing or something. And I heard his voice on a radio in Maryland. Talk. He was ready, getting ready to go have lunch with the President of the United States. So that's how we found the guy. Great pilot, even though he was trying to be a moving target. <clears throat> but the key, the key for us in dust-off was to find ways to get in during the battlefield. And if you used your imagination, and if you looked at the terrain, and you knew where the friendlies were, and you knew where the enemy was, and you knew what weapons the guy had, and you'd mix and mingle that in, a highway would actually spring out of the sky and show you how to get in that, that area. And so we did find different ways to get into different areas. And they talk about blowing away the smoke or the fog or whatever. I mean, where does it go? You can't blow it away. And the way we found this technique was one day in Vietnam, as you guys know, <clears throat> in the afternoon, the clouds built up on the outpost in the mountains. In the morning, you had low valley fog, about 500 feet, just like a snowbank. And we got a call. I had just gone back to Vietnam for my second tour, and I had a bunch of young uh, warrant officer aviators uh, right out of flight school. All their names started with an S. They all thought they were handpicked to fly dust off. Somebody just grabbed these guys and gave them to me. And they never had any experience at all. And But they were eager. They were ready to go. And I was worried about the weather. And I was worried about the mountains. And I know they would not stop. And I was worried about how to do these, especially these weather missions. So we got a call one day for a kid <clears throat> who was on the one of the outposts, and he'd been bitten by a snake. And those snakes in Vietnam, you know, it's like lay down so you don't hurt yourself falling because they were pretty deadly. And so initially we went into the area, and I knew I could fall out because it was uh, VFR under the clouds, but they were in the clouds on the top of the outpost. We start up into the outpost, and, of course, you get all screwed up, but I fall out in the valley, broke out, back up again, couldn't figure out how in the hell am I going to get in there. I could not see. So the crew's nervous. The guys are shouting at me, dust off, please, please hurry. He's going into convulsions. So I went back. I said, okay, guys, we got one more time. So we went around and started back up again, and I was totally disoriented, and the gust of wind blew me sidewards, and I always had my window down on the right side, and I was sure we were going in, so I looked out the window hoping to find a hole in the jungle, and guess what? I could see the tip of the rotor blade, and I could see the top of the trees, so I knew I was right side up, and I says, damn. So I turned that sucker sidewards. You could, you have to go very, very slow. This, the, the, the fog doesn't blow away. It's there, but you can see 20 feet to the end of your rotor blade, and if you've got two reference points, you can do it. We did it, first time. I got the guy to the hospital, and I think he lived. We used that technique from then on to get into uh, low valley fog areas and also uh, patients who are in the top of the mountains. That was one technique. We had a lot of other ones, too.
General Brady, how, well, first of all, I need to warn you, you've got a former Marine sitting next to oh, you, so, so be very, very <laughs> careful, okay? So, yeah, I'm surprised he didn't smack you or something <laughs> like that, but I guess rank has its privileges, right? So, uh, <laughs> um, I, I will say, you know, this day and age, we, we navigate with GPS and all that kind of stuff. How about your navigation techniques? You know, you, you read the citation, and you went to a variety of places, and weather was obviously a problem. You know, I mean, did you go out by, by radial and DME, or were you so familiar with the, the terrain and, and other references out there? How did you navigate? No, there was, there was uh, we had maps, <clears throat> and I'll tell you, here's how it worked with dust off after we finally got the resource refined. Uh, we were off the ground in two minutes in a Huey, and uh, the average time from the time the guy was shot until we had him in the operating room was 33 minutes. <clears throat> so if, if the odds of you getting shot in a jungle in Vietnam and surviving were greater than if you were in an accident in a highway in America because of that helicopter. But there was no nav aids, no nothing. Uh, what you did was uh, the, the co-pilot ran to the aircraft, cranked it. The aircraft commander went to the operations, and we got a heading, and we got a distance to the pickup site. The first thing you do when you lift off is you let the guy in the jungle know we're on the way because they're worried about his wounded friends, uh, his buddies, and they need to know that help is on the way. So you let them know. Now, as you get into the area, that's when you start analyzing the terrain, the enemy location, the friendly location, what signal. In the early days, we had problems with signals because it was all Vietnamese. We couldn't, they, we couldn't talk to them, but we could say smoke, whatever, and they would say green smoke is out, dust off. And guess what? You'd look down there and you'd find four or five green smokes. And we went into some wrong areas a little bit before we finally wised up. And so then after that, we would say, you got smoke, Raj. Okay, here's the deal. You pop smoke, I will identify the color. And so that we know it's you, and we're coming. A very simple thing, but it saved us a lot of heartaches uh, compared to the, f the first few times when we went into the wrong smoke, smoke thing. But essentially, uh, heading, distance, frequency, call sign, that's all we need. Now, if we had trouble finding him, if he was a lerp, if it was a lerp guy or something, you needed a hoist, uh, then oftentimes we would use our FM Homer uh, to get in and, and find him. Uh, the, the worst missions at this time, more of our people were being killed at night and in weather than were being killed by the enemy. We we're losing a lot of crews, a lot of aircraft because they were flying in the mountains and they were flying at night, get disoriented and, and uh, crash. So those, those, were, those were the things, but we found a way to do the weather in the daytime and later on we found a way to do the weather at night. Understand. How about, you know, the, 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 the mission that you earned the Medal of Honor on, uh, you, you went back and forth several times. Uh, what's a typical crew for your, your dust-off mission? How many guys? Crew? Okay. We had a, a pilot, co-pilot, medic, and a crew chief. Okay. And did any of them ever look at you and go, you're nuts, I don't want to go with you, um, and this is too dangerous? Or are you guys all on the same sheet of music? Well, you, you, uh, we had some cases where they would come back and never fly again. Oh. And so, uh, but not, did not happen very often. The most important thing, for example, the day of the Medal of Honor, we used the technique to go into the fog uh, to pick up the two Vietnamese uh, wounded. They're, they're, I was not on duty that day, but they called me because it was a weather mission and, and we knew how to do that. And then when we were lifting out of there, we heard about, actually they say 51, there were 70 patients in a valley in the same kind of circumstances. And so we said, they've been, they've been there all night, why, why hasn't somebody got them out? And so we went out to LZ West, but they, wouldn't let, they were not going to let me go in. And so the brigade commander then talked to my co-pilot, and he said, we can do it. Just give us a frequency. Just tell us who we're talking to, and we'll go get them. They were actually in the fog right below the base. And so you got to have a willing co-pilot, and you got to have willing crew members. And when you got that, the crew works together. There's no problems. But if you got somebody that's afraid or somebody that's not willing, 
or worried or some way uh, not really dedicated to the mission, uh, that's not good. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the team has to be together and we all have to have to be dedicated to getting that wounded guy out. And you go after him like you'd want somebody to come after you or the way you'd want somebody to come after your wounded relative or friends. You just give it all you got. Mm -hmm. Who is the initiator of the, uh, the dust-off mission? Who started all that? This, this was all started by Charles Kelly, and he was a World War II veteran. I, I write about him in my book. We just came back from Vietnam three or four weeks ago, well, actually in early May, and we dedicated a memorial to him there near the spot where he was killed. But he was killed trying to rescue some people uh, in a very trying time when they were trying to use portable red crosses. It's a complicated story, but he gave his life to save dust off, which eventually saved, in Vietnam alone, a million lives. And from then on to today, who knows how many lives it stayed in Afghanistan and Iraq, but the call sign is still dust off, and that was Charles Kelly's dust off. His dying words, when he landed in an area, a hot area, and they said, get out, get out, we're under fire. Uh, his dying words, when I have your wounded, he took a round right through the heart and killed him on the spot. Uh, but those are the inspiration for dust-off pilots, the standard for dust-off pilots and combat medics to this day. So he was probably the most remarkable soldier I ever met. Interesting. Very interesting. Okay, how about um, a typical day as a dust-off pilot? I mean, did you, <coughs> you work, um, you know, 12 hours and just, again, on alert, basically? Um, it's 20, 24 hours. Okay. We, as I said, uh, or maybe that was earlier, we, in a nine-and-a-half-month period with six assigned UH-1H models, only one time we would have three flyable, three that were flyable. In a nine and a half month period, we evacuated over 21,000 patients. Now those same aircraft, there was more than us, all the dust off units in Vietnam were doing the same thing. So we averaged something like 28 combat missions a day, four at night, 16 hours flying time every day. We were on 24 hours at a time, first up ship, second up ship, and the third one was a hoist. And so uh, we rigged a, a, a horn to a battery thing, and so when the horn went off, if it was the first aircraft, one blast, second aircraft, two blasts, and, and then we <clears throat> ran to the aircraft, and as I said, we were off the ground in two minutes. I think uh, the most challenging uh, but the weather missions in the daytime, but the most challenging missions were night weather missions. And as I said, that was killing it. And I'll tell you quickly how we found out how to solve that problem. <clears throat> I was out, you got low valley or uh, flat terrain here, and then you go into the mountains. And the mountains went up to about, this was in the Chulai area. The mountains went up to five or 6,000 feet, I think and valleys and things in between them. And so one day I'm sitting out in the valley on a quiet mission. And, uh, the, you know, if you've ever been at night like that where the tracers and the flares and everything, it's just kind of, it's kind of pretty, really. <laughs> and so you're sitting there and I'm, I'm looking at the scenery and then I, here's a, here's a mountain. And the mountain is in the clouds all the way down here. And I look, and a flare come down by that mountain. I could see the silhouette of that mountain. And it, I didn't think anything of it at the time, but it just kind of stuck in my head. So fast forward uh, a couple of weeks or so, we get a call from the 101st, and they're out in an area that was uh, called Dis Valley, and they had a whole bunch of wounded, and it's in the middle of a tropical uh, storm. And so I tried to use a technique that we used in the Delta, which at night in the Delta with all the canals and everything, you could get on a canal and with your searchlight, you could follow it like a highway right into the pickup zone. Very easy navigation, no wires, no mountains, no nothing. It was beautiful, no problem at night. Mountains are a different deal. And so uh, 
I initially tried to follow a river up into the place, but it was raining so hard that it was coming off the window and it was blinding me. And you would have a crew chief in the front and a crew chief in the back, and you'd watch for a light in front of you, and you'd watch for a light behind you. In case you got stuck, you could turn around and get out of there. Well, it was like ink. I just couldn't do it. I couldn't get up that river. And then I had this friggin' vision of that mountain in the clouds. But I had a D-model Huey, and it did not have good instruments on it. And so I knew how I was going to do it. I went back. Got another airplane uh, with a transponder and another crew. And then I told him, I want a vector to the pickup site. I'm going to go to about 6,000 feet IFR to the pickup site. Air Force flare ship was at 9,000 feet. And I says, I want you guys to drop flares, and I'm going to see if I can circle those flares down through the mountains and get in, use my FM homer to get in and pick up those guys. And so the Air Force guy's not sure what's going on, and the son of a gun stopped the flares when I'm about 1,500 feet and 3,000-foot mountains. But the beautiful thing about the Huey was you just stop it and just straight up. You don't dare go any direction because you'll hit a mountain. So I finally got the guy trained, and so he kept the flare in the, in the sky, lighted all the time, and we came down through that stuff, and we got in there, and we got those wounded out. ITO up above the mountains, back to the hospital. We circle over the ocean until we saw the lights of Chulai, and then we go into the hospital. So we made four trips that night doing this, using the same technique, and we got every one of them out. And after that, we were never stopped by night weather, nor were we ever stopped by day weather. We never left a patient in the field, period. Wow. I, I will say it's really nice these days to have night, night vision goggles. Um, and that was way before that. <clears throat> All right. You were talking about the UE. This is the exact model UE that you flew. Is that correct? A UE-1H. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, let's shift gears for a second. I'll give you a break. And we're going to let Dave talk a little bit about his aircraft. First of all, Dave, thank you so much to bring it here. Um, it is a beautiful aircraft. And uh, all right. Tell us a little bit about the acquisition. You know, where did it come from? Well, it came from uh, Olympia, Washington, uh, where we bought it from uh, Northwest Helicopters in 19, uh, 2015. Uh, just uh, happened, uh, my partner uh, came to me at a, I flew T6s for quite a few years, and uh, he could, we were at a safety meeting in Minneapolis, and uh, Barry says, uh, Dave, I want to talk to you after the meeting. Okay, and uh, so the meeting was over. What's up, Barry? He said, well, I want to, uh, my son and I want to buy a Huey. I said, all right, well, how much time you got in the helicopters? Well, none, but uh, <laughs> uh, we're going to flight school. Said, okay, well, let's just start. Uh, and I had just been in the uh, trader plane, uh, and uh, I saw there were a couple for sale, and uh, so then that's what's where it started. Okay, but but there's more to that. I told you, as former Marine, but but what did you fly for the Marines? I flew CH-46. Uh, uh, I was in. Uh, uh, Vietnam 6970 and HMM 364 uh, at uh, Marble Mountain. Okay, uh, so 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 he was a Marine CH 46 kind of guy there. So yeah. so he's okay. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> okay, so you you acquired it. Was there a great deal of restoration required? Actually, no. It was pretty well restored. It uh, it was in Vietnam in uh, 66 67 and damaged. And uh, we've got uh, kind of a history on it, and it was uh, returned uh, to the States, which is kind of unusual for a Huey, and uh, went to Corpus Christi uh, and was re, uh, redone, and then flew around uh, the country in uh, uh, guard units. And, and it was in uh, Savannah, Georgia, where, when I actually was Army trained. Uh, I was in uh, OCS, got out of OCS in uh, uh, June of 68, uh, and Pensacola was backlogged, and the the Marines and the Navy got a, a few slots in the Army, so uh, I went uh, TAD to the Army for nine months. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he's okay, right? He's he got his <laughs> Army training. Uh, so, uh, so they didn't know what to do with us uh, down in uh, Fort Walters or uh, in, in Savannah. They just left us alone. Just We, we just flew uh, and uh, turned out uh, good. And the, my uh, fellow uh, Navy train, uh, they used to call us uh, Army pukes. And uh, so we'd end up calling them Navy pukes or whatever. But when we got to Vietnam, 
I had 100, uh, 208 hours, I believe, in uh, helicopters and 80 hours in Huey in flight school. And uh, we could fly the, a helicopter uh, coming out of the na uh, Navy in the Pensacola. They only had 80 hours in 34s or uh, uh, I think they uh, 206s, something like that. So when I start flying with it, hey, you guys can fly. So I, we didn't get called Army Pukes for too awfully long. And, uh, so uh, it, was, it was interesting, but uh, I, uh, I enjoyed my time in the Army. But I, I went back in the Marines after I uh, got out of flight school. Outstanding. Okay. And I'll ask General Brady, what, you know, th this is how much time you got in one of these things? In the Huey? Yeah. I haven't got a lot of time. Probably uh, all of it was in, in Vietnam. Most of my time in the Huey was in the Vietnam, and it's about uh, 17, 1800 hours uh, okay. in, in Vietnam. But we flew, uh, I mean, this, I can't tell you what a joy it was. Uh, to to have this thing when we got to Vietnam. Before that, they had the H-13. It took both feet, both legs, and a wrist to fly one of those things. And it, is, it does with the 34, too, I think, right? You still got that damn thing? It, <laughs> <coughs> in a 19, I swear to God, well, we flew single ship, single pilot missions in the 19, and it was, it's like this bird, not as big, not as good. But at the end of the day, your left wrist and your left leg were just absolutely worn out. And you had to transfer fuel and you had to read maps and do all that. But that, I think, made me a better pilot. Because when I got in this thing, I mean, you just jerked that sucker off the ground. And it would pick up anything you could put on it. And we were talking the other day <clears throat> about how many patients, how many is the most patients you ever got on that thing. And uh, my co-pilot said one night we picked up a guy named Webster Anderson who was uh, later on became a Medal of Honor recipient. But he was, he was on a mountaintop in a tropical storm. We used the flares and everything. And my co-pilot who kept the record after the after action report said we, we had 21 people on there, 21 American soldiers. And another pilot recently I heard said he had 27 on there. Now if you've got women and children uh, then you can get them, but we did not use we did not use litters unless it was a head or a neck thing, and uh, you stacked them in there because you knew you were going to have them in an operating room in 15 minutes or so, and that was the key to saving their life. Stop the stop the blood, you know. You protect what they got of one, and you make sure they're getting the other, and that's blood and air. And with those two things, uh, 15 minutes, double amputees, sucking, ch you name it. And we get them in the operating room, and they're going to live. I forget the numbers exactly, but Vietnam set survival records never before to this day paralleled in combat. I think 10% of our people were wounded in Vietnam. Uh, and of that 10% who were wounded, less than 1% died. And so if we got our hands on you, you were going to live, unless you were already dead. And so that was just a basic fact, and the, the troops really appreciated that. But this was, this was it. It was not so much us. We had a, mach a machine that we had faith in that we knew could do anything we asked it to do and, uh, and was, was great in the jungle. It was quick. It had a nice attitude for approach at night. We, f we flew blacked out. We had no lights on at night. And we did not use lights when we landed. <clears throat> so you had to have a signal on the ground. And it could be one of my pilots landed at one night to a flicking Zippo lighter. And so if you've got a, a light and you, you could take this thing, you could stop it above the trees. And then you could tilt it. And then you keep that light between you and the ground. And uh, you don't need a searchlight. They don't want you to use a searchlight because it exposes their position. And it'll get you down there, and then the crew will tell you when you can set it down. And so, couldn't do it, couldn't, could not have done it without this bird. It was, it was a lifesaver. And by the way, it's the most combat experienced aircraft in history. The Air Force weenies with all their fighter pilots and all that crap. I mean, and this, this bird has uh, seven million. 
combat hours or something. More Medal of Honor recipients, except for one, one World War II aircraft, I think. I had a friend who ran a museum out in Seattle, the Museum of Flight. He's got all these fixed-wing aircraft. And I said, for God's sakes, why don't you put a real airplane in here? Those people don't fly, they ride. You only really fly a helicopter. Everybody knows that. So the guy had a lot of money, but it took him a long time. And finally, we got a, a Huey helicopter in the Museum of Flight in Seattle. And more people visit that than any of the other aircraft there. And that's understandable, because it's better than all the rest of them. OK, I think the interview is over. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming, General. Uh, I, it was just a question of when, that's all. So uh, I, I accept the, uh, the hits, and uh, what can I say? Um, but I will go on, shift gears a little bit, and talk to Mike a little bit about his aircraft that's here. And oh, by the way, there's bullet holes. We said bullet holes in the floorboards of the UE over there that have been patched up. Is that right? We think so. Uh, the, uh, 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 the skin was, was repaired, but there's certain unidentifiable holes uh, in the floor. Okay. Right, yeah. And that brings me to the Skorsky over there, because I guess there's a lot of bullet holes in that thing. Yeah. And Mike, I'll say again, thank you so much for bringing it here. It is a, a beautiful aircraft. And uh, tell us a little bit about acquisition of that. First of all, with utmost respect to the general, when I joined the Navy, they told us we were going to take care of the Air Force, the Army, the Marine Corps. So basically, that's what they told us. So we, we kind of felt like we, we took care of you guys. So There you go. But okay. Thank you. That's the, one the, hit back. Yeah. Okay. okay. The Sikorsky has uh, 54 documented bullet holes, and it has some damage history uh, in Vietnam. It uh, basically was uh, the second time it was um, uh, damaged, it was sent to Japan. That's how it basically... Uh, survived. It uh, uh, was up there when the uh, HMM 362 squadron in 1968, they were told to go home and they gave all the rest of the uh, helicopters to the South Vietnamese. And um, this one was up in Japan, was sent to the States, flew in a Guardian a couple of years and then sent to Davis Mothin. Mm -hmm. And you got a crew chief out here that's got some real background with it, yes. is that right? Ed Tatman. We had five crew chiefs at one time within the Tulsa, about 100 miles of Tulsa area that actually flew in the squadron with this helicopter. And Ed is uh, one of the ones that came with us today uh, from Tulsa. He lives in Stigler, Oklahoma, and uh, he flew on in this unit uh, in 1967-68. The, the crew chiefs... By the way, the crew chiefs were our parachute. I mean, of all the soldiers of every kind of training imaginable that I ever served with, the helicopter crew chief was the finest trained, most capable, most competent soldier I ever served with. Just that simple. And I'll pass it over to Ed for a minute. Any comments right now, Ed, about uh, serving and, and that particular aircraft? Are we ready here? Yeah. Uh, did your engineers, producers want us out here? Yeah, that's fine. You're, okay. you're good. Uh, I appreciate the comments, and, and uh, I would say, and kind of going back, and, and to honor our, our general, uh, to me, every time you've climbed in that cockpit, you've got to understand what these pilots went through. I cannot, in my wildest imagination, imagine setting up there holding that stick in a hover and in some cases, we would have this wheel on a rock, and it might be two or 3,000 feet off the side right here, and uh, knowing at any time that could end. And uh, to sit there and hold those sticks uh, while we're trying to do our job and everything, uh, just beyond imagination to me. So uh, no disrespect to the one mission. I think you should have got one every time you got behind the stick. And, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, I've been flying with this aircraft since uh, uh, 99. We've been going 23 years. Uh, we lost our leader in 15 and things slowed down tremendously. Just took the wind out of her sails and, and uh, he was the driving force that uh, uh, was behind us and, and so on. He was a non-military man. He was totally civilian. And uh, uh, so he bought this thing for a uh, parts vehicle to support another 34 for lift. 
And uh, so he pushed it to the back of the hangar for 12, 14 years. It was stacked full of pieces. When they picked it up in 1985, this young man, Jesse, step out here just a little bit. This is the son of Mike. He is our second generation pilot. And when we're gone, he's going to carry on. I'm not going to tell you his age, but in 1985, he was 10 years old. They went, <laughs> they went to Tucson, Arizona to pick this aircraft up, and whoever was in charge of the yard there says, boys, help me clean this up. Load everything you can in it. And I think you loaded about 18 or 20 of these blades, and they had to walk them back into the tail pylon to get them in there. And then they had to kind of glove them like this, and then stuff uh, foam rubber they could find and uh, uh, things on top of them to protect them and so on. And of course, they're the most valuable thing. They don't reproduce those and they do time out. And when they time out, they go in a scrap pile or go on a static display somewhere. And uh, uh, Jesse rode down in the old truck and, and their air conditioner was uh, what we affectionately referred to when I was a kid as a, a 265. That's two wing windows turned in and 65 mile an hour and about 105 degree heat. And, uh, but they got down there and, and uh, trucked that thing full of parts and brought it home. It went in the hangar for 10, 12, 15 years. The lift business did not materialize. Another business was lucrative enough to, to keep them going. And it was just kind of forgotten until a guy called and wanted to purchase some parts out of it. And Gerald, uh, our, our leader, got in that thing and, and went to digging around and he found a cardboard box in there with the log books and stuff in it for this aircraft. And him being a civilian type individual, he went to leafing through it and uh, found uh, entries that said battle damage at station such and such and battle damage at station such and such. And, and so he called Mike. Mike, uh, being a military man, he told him this. And Mike says, Gerald, I think you've got a warbird up there. So they got the log book down and got to doing a little more dissecting and, and decided they did. Uh, went to putting it back together. The mission changed. Uh, went to putting it back together. What you see here is just almost 100% original. The interior of this aircraft has never been touched except for probably a power wash. I think when it came out of the desert, it had probably an inch of, of sand in it and dirt and debris. and, and uh, the outside has been rubbed and scrubbed. When we get back out to our location, we've got a picture that's got the bullet holes targeted and uh, uh, kind of give you some idea. And if you look through the cargo door, you, you can look right at three or four of them right in there. There's one of them for a six foot tall man. It is straight in the door, right behind one of the seats. And when we get back out there, I'll try to drop the back of that Kansas, uh, that canvas seat a little bit where you can see that damage. Uh, it's, it sticks out pretty clearly there. And of course, when you go to the other side and look at that picture, why, uh, you'll know what it is. Uh, this has been a tremendous ride. Uh, we take it as a learning tool to schools. We can do things, them guys, we can do things these guys with them wings that stick out like that can't do. We can put it in a schoolyard. This aircraft's been in over 200 schoolyards and probably as many veterans events and, and on and on and on uh, in the 23, 23 years we've been going since 1999. Uh, it's a healing tool. We get around behind it every once in a while, uh, have a little prayer meeting back there. It's an educational tool, it's a healing tool, and it's also a flying memorial to 33 of our squadron mates that paid the ultimate sacrifice right here. And uh, so uh, obviously we, we feel like that thing demands uh, the first respect for sure. And I uh, had a young man walk by yesterday, I'm getting too old to fight, fair, 
and uh, he was pushing the bassinet and had a couple families with him. Uh, and they kind of rolled up, and, and he said, if you've seen one old airplane, you've seen them all. And I stood and, and thought about that and visited with Jesse. Uh, I'm getting to where I think these things out a little better than I did at one time. <laughs> and part of me just almost went and invited him to come over and read this, give it a minute, and get away from the aircraft. It's not just another old airplane. And, the, and all these airplanes, or most of them out here, the warbirds especially, have got tails to tail. Uh, let, uh, let's let Jesse, if we can, can we do that, Jim? We're gonna, uh, we were gonna do a walk around and, and, and talk a little pilot stuff. We're running out of time. Um, so I'm going to save that until like after the questions, and we're going to open it up to questions because I'm sure people have, have got questions about the aircraft. Um, but I just want to want to end the formal portion here with a, a, this is the, the last part of your book, General Brady, and I, I, I found it very interesting. And this oh. is this is something if yeah you're in trouble now. I'm I'm going to try to get even. No, I'm not going to get even. Um, but uh, he makes a. Uh, poignant comment here, and I'll read it. It says, whatever happens to our bodies as we age, our minds are not devoid of romance and we still dream. In my dreams, I am again a captain, not a general. Hurrying into the mist of the moist morning fog or inky blackness, climbing into the cabin, surrounded by the sweet cell of JP4, strapping in to the detent, the trigger, the sweet, sweet smell of JP4, um, the whining engine, the bumpy roar, and off across tracer mark terrain. Voices in my ear begging for wounded comrades. Hurry, dust off. Then the signal, the terrain, the enemy, the highway. Down on the collective, forward on the cyclic. Kick it out of trim. Hard over to the ground, dodging trees, dipping into paddies, snaking forward swiftly. Stop. Hard left pedal, right cyclic. A fast, flat turn, no float. Down to the ground. Confusion. We got them. Clear on the right, the left. Oops. The sharp crack of gunfire snapping through our bird. Crew okay, no red lights. Up, steady, right pedal rotating into translational. Speed, then altitude, then more speed. Full bore ahead into the caring hands of a physician and life. And that was in the tail end of his book, and you can see what this man is really concerned about. And this isn't the general, this is the captain, and he st still dreams that. Thank you, General Brady. Thank you. All right, we've got about eight minutes right now, not a lot of time, but I'm going to open it up to questions, and then afterwards, like I said, General Brady is going to be signing books back in the, uh, uh, that building right there, and, uh, and I highly recommend the book. Um, I will also say thank you to American Airlines. Uh, American Airlines uh, helped you out in getting here, from what I understand. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, they used to be my former employer for about 33 years also. Oh. So I, I appreciate, appreciate the, uh, the, the ride they gave you and their support. Um, and with that, we'll open it up to quick questions. Go ahead, up the top there. Uh, so General, first I'd like to say thanks for the presentation you gave today. It was very interesting. From a pilot's perspective, um, I was curious, because you hear a lot of stories about heavily damaged Hueys getting their crews back and surviving you know, these, these dust-off missions. Is there something special about the Huey that gave it that sort of robustness and ability to take hits and, and stay in the air? Well, it, it did not have uh, armor. It was, you can't do that much to a helicopter, but we did have... Uh, what, what, what's that Kevlar? We had a Kevlar thing here on our side that you could slide out after you got into it. And we all carried a pistol. And guess where we put that pistol? That was it. <laughs> and some of them would put, uh, put a, uh, something in the bubble down there. So you didn't have a lot of protection, but the bird did take a lot of punishment. And you could uh, fill the rotor blades with bullets. Uh, the most beautiful advance from the old uh, air helicopters, some of, the gr some of the hardest training we had in the early days was to get into a burning ship and get the wounded out. Somebody created a fuel cell. That sucker didn't burn. Of all the crash sites, and we were just talking about this, of all the crash sites that went into Vietnam, 
I don't think, I can't remember off the top of my head, any of them that caught on fire. So that bird would go to the ground and uh, crash, but it didn't burn. And the saying in the early days of my flying was, if you don't get killed in the crash, you'll burn to death. But the Huey had a beautiful cell, even with the tracer. Uh, it would take a lot of rounds and still keep on flying. And uh, the, the, the only thing that would stop it really uh, from getting to the ground is if you killed the pilot and the co-pilot. Then there was an issue. But the bird, no matter how many rounds it took, unless it hit something, uh, something really vital, the transmission was the most dangerous thing because if that blade stopped, then you're dead. But as long as the blade's moving and uh, you got controls and nobody's hurt, you can get that thing to the ground on a dime. We used to, in training, we'd turn the engine off and shoot auto rotations, try to see who could hit a spot closer than the other guy. And now they'll, they won't do that. They'll shoot out of rotations to about 50 feet and then recover, which, I mean, you're not going to crash at 50 feet. What the hell good does that do you? <laughs> but, uh, no, I, I can't tell you how much I love this bird and how many lives that it saved. And we were just instruments. But it was this, this, this wonderful machine uh, was so quick and so powerful uh, that uh, saved lives and could take so much battle damage and still survive that I can't tell you how many friends I have who have crashed this thing I don't know how many times and are still walking around. Another question right here. General Lum, dust off 39 out of Pleiku, 1968. Oh. That's not a dust off bird. Would you explain? Well, it's got guns on it. So we People never... need to know that. Huh? People need to know that. Well, the, the, you know, they talk a lot about the uh, uh, Geneva Accords and everything. We were armed, but uh, we, we had a rifle, and I got, I got all my guys' pistols, too. Uh, the crew chief and the gunner, or the crew chief and the medic had a rifle and a pistol because they had to leave the bird, go into the jungle, and drag the patients out, and they could not be unarmed while they are doing that. And you can't carry an M16 and a and a person at the same time. So we were armed to protect ourselves and to protect our patients. And so that's, that's why we were armed. Now, there were some dust-off medevac units who actually mounted uh, w weapons, which is really stupid because it takes, you have to get one more person on there on each side to man the damn thing. You can't hit shit with it. I don't care who you are. You can't hit anything with it, and you don't know where the fire is coming from. So why? And the worst thing is the noise. When I would tell them, "Don't shoot, no mad minute." I don't want to hear anything when I come in. I don't, don't shoot. The first time I went in, everybody's shooting like crazy, and the guys in the back are shooting like crazy, and the damn hot rounds are going down the back of my flight suit, and I think I'm dead. So no shooting, quiet, nice quiet approach. Then, if you hear somebody shooting, you know it's the bad guy, and you could do you could do whatever you have to do to get the hell out of there. So there's conflicting thoughts. Some guys, one guy, one of my pilots talked about gunships and shooting and all that, and I finally said, "What good does it do?" And he says, "Well, it makes me feel better." And I thought, "What the hell have I got here?" But so it's not. Uh, I, I, the guns, uh, as I said, the medevacs from the first cab, not the first cab, but the 101st, or the, yeah, the first cab, I think they mounted machine guns on the side of their aircraft, which were just stupid, really. Took up space, more weight, less room for patients, and you can't hit anything. You know, uh, we, in the early days, we were trying to teach our pilots how to shoot if they had to out of a helicopter. Guess what? You shoot behind the target. Now, how long does it take to teach a guy to shoot behind the target? It's difficult. We had an area where we had a bunch of peacocks, and we had lanes going down through there, and these guys would practice on the peak. Believe me, those peacocks were perfectly safe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we've got that perspective down. Thank you. All right, another question up here. Um, you mentioned that uh, the crew was uh, a medic, 
and the two pilots and uh, the crew chief, and then there was also a gunner, correct? No? Not on my bird. No? There was a gunner. Your crew members, the, the, the crew chief and the medic, were your protect. If you got into an area and you're on the ground and you start receiving fire and you see where it's coming from, they were armed and they could return the fire. Oh, but okay. I discouraged that. Right. And uh, because, you know, just to hit a guy in the jungle, it's just wasting ammo. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult. Mm -hmm. And the most important thing was to get in there and out as fast as you could. No, we did not. I never, would never carry a gunner. Although, as I said, the medevac helicopters in the first cab did have gunners. Total waste. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay. Other questions? Okay, we got one over here. How long could the Huey stay up in the air? The, we, we counted, uh, for my purposes, we counted for about two hours. Is that about right? And then at the end of two hours, uh, the 20-minute warning light would come on. And the one thing you knew when that light came on, you didn't have 20 minutes. So that was the limit. And so we had, beautiful thing about it was my second tour, my first tour, we actually refueled in 55-gallon drums with a chamois cloth out in the middle of the patties. Second tour, we refueled hot and we could refuel. So we'd go 15 hours without getting out of the seat uh, without any problem at all because they had fuel for us everywhere and hospitals too. And that was the most important thing. That's why our missions were so quick you know, 33 minutes from the time the guy shot until he's in an operating room, you just, you're just not going to die. Mike, I got a quick question. You talked about Armin. We got the, uh, the M60s here. How about Armin on the uh, Sikorsky? What was, uh, what was standard? Same thing. Two okay. M60s. Yeah, one on this side and yeah, one on the other side. Okay. All right. Another question. Anybody anywhere over one, here? Uh, we got. Oh, got a youngster. <laughs> that guy looks like he's going to be a helicopter pilot. Looks like a smart guy to me. <laughs> go ahead. How fast do the helicopters need to go to get off the ground? Well, I think it redlined at, what, 130 knots? We flew at about 120. Uh, but to get off the ground? Oh, to get off the ground, line, well, you have, to, you have to hit, you know, the trick... Uh, is when you got a load, the trick is hitting, hitting uh, translational. And the way I used to do it with a heavy load was, and, and some of them would have to splice their way through a rice paddy just to get enough airspeed. These were, were a lot of time it was the gunships, which were overloaded, and some of the slicks too, just to hit translational so you get up in the air. But I found that if I dipped it to the right with right pedal, it took demand off the engine, gave me more power, and I could get translational sideways and then turn into the, to the flight. And so uh, taking off, you're just like the speed of walking. But then the first thing you want to do is get speed, and then you want to get altitude. You got that, young man? <laughs> I Go to helicopter ready. school. Yeah, I was going to say, put him in school. Yeah. He's ready. All right, go ahead, Karen. What I'd like to know, the Yui is the sexy bird out there, but the H-34 uh, is the workhorse. I'd like to know what a typical mission was for that airplane and uh, the type of things they had to do to accomplish those. And that's for the Sikorsky, yeah. you're asking. Typical mission for the Sikorsky. Okay. Who wants to... Uh, That'd be Ed. He did the missions. Okay. So Go ahead, Ed. Or, or Jesse. I'd say uh, Ed is uh, the one that can uh, explain this, but they pretty much used it for anything that they could put in it or put into the into the field. Uh, since I've been here this week, I've told the story probably half a dozen times. I'd kind of uh, gotten rusty at telling the stories. Uh, we actually hauled a singing group, and I think they were the Ronettes. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful three girls, girls of color. They were gorgeous. They had beehive hairdos. They smelled pretty. I was in love. <laughs> and we took them into a zone with Huey gunships escort. 
We flew into a mountain outpost. The girls got out. We went back up and spun around for about 30 minutes and went back in and got them and, and brought them back somewhere and let them out. We didn't just hop them around. Uh, so I don't know if one of them had a brother on that outpost or something. I feel like there might have been something special going on here. But uh, it was the aircraft, if you can only imagine, was used for everything conceivable in the world. And it was actually used for medevacs. Uh, it had no markings on it. Uh, we wasn't trying to hide from anybody or, or identify or anything. We, we might take a recon mission in and then automatically become a medevac. How about, how about a typical time for the mission? How long do you think that thing, what, what, you know, how to compare to a Huey? Another, a couple hour mission, is that probably I about right? I don't think I could compare because I, I wasn't associated with Hueys. Uh, we just all just worked all day long, uh, sun up to sundown, 24 hours. I believe the general said a while ago, uh, it was 24-7. Uh, the air wing saved my life. The neat thing about it uh, that I never occurred to me when I joined was the air wing. We did get to go home in most occasions back to a secure base, you know, and, and uh, have a hot meal and a clean, dry bed. Uh, medevac might come at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, so we had to go to the old club and drag the officers out of it and slap them around a little bit, you know, and help them in the cockpit. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> the young guys. Got it. Yeah, I understand. The young guys. Yeah, yeah, not us old guys. Yep. And, uh, but uh, I wish we had the time to tell you about the ceremonial buffalo. Uh, no, we, don't, no. we do not that'll have be, time to tell later. that story, and it may not be appropriate. Yeah. But uh, anyway, uh, you just name whatever you could use a helicopter or a pickup truck for, or a Jeep or whatever, a pack mule. Ah, uh, so Jesse, how much fuel does that hold? It holds just shy of uh, 300 gallons. Okay. It's got a two-hour range, just like the Huey does. We have a 30-minute uh, fuel light, but it feels like three minutes. So <laughs> we see the light come on, we land. So oh, I understand. It's, uh, and it's doing about, uh, it's burning 65 to 70, economical, trying to just get it here and home and stuff like that, but in a hover, it's... Uh, with a load, it's burning 110 to 115 an hour. Okay, and you brought this thing from Oklahoma, right? Oklahoma. We're in the Tulsa oh. area. And, and and how fast cruise speed wise? Uh, we were coming up here. We had we got lucky with the wind gods. Uh, we had a tailwind, so we were doing about 100 uh, knots over the ground. Okay. We were indicating about 75 to 80, mm -hmm. and uh, it took us about uh, just shy of six hours to get here. Okay. And uh, uh, lots of gallons of gas. Okay. So. <laughs> I, I got to ask General Brady, what's the fastest you had a Yui? Fastest I've had it going? Yeah. We had, uh, well, one of my guys uh, was uh, Hook, and you can read about him in the book. Uh, he, he uh, the aircraft was hit with a mortar, and by the time I got to him, he had a lot of head wounds, and I was really, really worried and so I bent that damn thing over, and uh, it was right at the red line, which is what, 130, 123 is a published one. I'm sure it'll go faster than that. Well, the red, and the ones we had, I think there was a red line there, and the aircraft started to shudder a little, and my co-pilot brought me back to my senses. And so I, I eased back. The beautiful thing about it was that there was one neurosurgeon in the country and he was in our hospital that day. And so we got hooked into the hospital probably within 20 minutes. Like I say, you can read about the mission in my book. It was really a miraculous thing. And, and that surgeon opened up his head. And, uh, and to the day, he was a big, tall farm boy from Iowa, a great, great medic. And, uh, but he lived. And we played golf. He wasn't worth the shit on the golf course, but <laughs> he had he had two daughters, this Iowa farm guy. Now listen to this. And he's he's also in the Aviation Hall of Fame. Uh, he uh, one daughter is a PhD from Duke and the other has a master's degree from the University of Iowa. So this I don't know if he got out of the eighth grade or not. But uh, 
he was a he was a medic supreme. But anyhow, I got him on the bird, and I was really worried. And so I bent that damn thing over a lot more than I should have. And we might have had some mass bumping. And so, but anyhow, we got him to the hospital. But I think 130 knots is is about the fastest I ever went in that thing. But when you're on the trees and you're going 120 knots, that's fun. But if one of those trees hits you, it feels like a sledgehammer. Really, even if it's a little small limb or something, if it just hits you, it's like a damn sledgehammer. All right. Any other questions out there? We got one right up front here, sounds like. I heard rumors. I, I was reading somewhere that uh, there's one uh, rescue copter went in to save some people and uh, that there was no way to land and they actually used the rotor blades to chop their way into the jungle to make a pickup. Is there any credence to that? Yeah, that I've heard that. I've heard that before, but if the guy did that, he was really stupid because uh, that, that, that blade will chop down some, and we, as I said, we had a bunch of very inexperienced young pilots, and we went through rotor blades like crazy. We were hitting trees all the time, but you don't chop your way into an area unless you're really dumb. Thank you, guys. You, you look up the definition of... of Hero in, well, I'd say the, the, the dictionary, but now I guess I've got to say the Internet. And the first word is courage. The second is significant achievements. And the third is nobility. And we've got that man in our presence today. So oh, thank, thank, you, thank you, General thank Brady. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. God bless you. You bet. Pleasure being Thanks, with Dave. you guys. Appreciate it. Good job. Mike, appreciate it. You yeah. bet. Good being Thank with you. Thank you, folks. I Afternoon, this. we uh, have a veterans parade. So you veterans, please, 1 o'clock, be here. Good morning, Oshkosh. How's everybody doing this morning? Man, you, can you believe the weather these days, day after day after day? And I've been half joking about this. Man, I want to find the Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce in addition to war words here for arranging this sunny sunny blue skies for us every single day for us to come out and uh, perform for you. My name is Chip Berger. I'm the voice of the Warbirds Living History Group. Warbirds Living History Group is a cast of characters, amateur historians, living historians, reenactors. Our camp is, well you can't see because there's a big beautiful helicopter behind me, but if you go that direction and look for a lot of olive drab canvas, that's going to be our campground. Alternatively, just follow your nose. The smell of musty campus, you can't miss that 100 yards away. Seriously, come please see us. Um, you can see what the uh, uh, historian, living historians, reenactors have on close up and personal in camp, plus the World War II gear that we have, vehicles, etc. We'd love for you to come by, ask questions, talk gear off, share history, tell tales, exchange stories, etc. Um, so please do come see us when you have time later today. So our role here as part, uh, as, as the opening act, the warm-up act sometimes I refer to us, uh, is to put a human face. Um, you're going to have some gentlemen who are going to talk about these uh, magnificent beasts uh, with the uh, rotors on top, uh, their stories, stories about the aircraft, etc. We're going to try to give, give you a face and insight into the crew, what they wore, why they wore it, how the technology changed over time, etc., what uh, was used by aircraft and uh, men of that era. Um, in, in multiple times of warfare, it's amazing how the uh, technology advanced during the conflict. They figured out what wasn't working, got something better into the hands of the fighting men and fighting women. Um, and uh, we're going to hear to, to kind of tell you that tale. I'm going to start off handing a, uh, the microphone off to Captain Knapp, who's going to describe what he's wearing and the stories behind that. And then we'll get to these men in olive drab secondarily. Okay. Captain Knapp. Thank you, Chip. Thank you, Chip. Good morning, everybody. So, uh, what you see me portraying today is that of a rescue helicopter pilot. So, we obviously have two beautiful helicopters behind us. Uh, Vietnam was, as many of you may already know, was a helicopter war. It really was when the helicopter really came into being as a combat aircraft. Um, what I'm portraying today, again, is Air Force Rescue, which started seeing service in the early 1950s and 1960s, and 
really started uh, going into combat search and rescue instead of just the uh, typical air-sea rescue element that the uh, air rescue service of the U.S. Air Force uh, was tasked with doing in the 50s and 60s. So, Air Force Rescue uh, was sent to Vietnam, was not necessarily prepared to, f uh, to fight behind uh, or go in deep behind enemy lines to pick up uh, downed aviators, but they adapted and uh, started to um, fly with what they had, which was, uh, believe it or not, orange flight suits, because the Air Rescue Service uh, flying over water, uh, uh, typically rescuing downed aviators at sea, wanted to be able to be visible to other rescue forces if they uh, found themselves in the water. Uh, when they went to Vietnam, uh, they also took with them uh, survival vests uh, so that when they uh, had to potentially be forced down, they had all the survival equipment that they would need uh, to survive uh, not only element, elements, but to evade capture from the enemy. Uh, and with that, I also have my trusty uh, sidearm, 1911 uh, 45 ACP with me. Uh, got the typical uh, black flight boots that would have been worn in the day. And I have uh, the typical early war or early Vietnam War style uh, flight helmet. Uh, has the uh, boom mic for communications and a sun visor to protect my eyes while I am flying the helicopter itself. Now, as the war progressed, Air Force Rescue got more experienced and uh, changed its gear, uh, kind of more conforming with what the Army helicopter aviators uh, would have. And I'll turn it back uh, over to Chip. Thank you, Captain Knapp. And uh, there's a reason I call him Captain Knapp. Uh, when it comes to uh, being a rescue pilot, he is active duty. So how about another round of applause? Thank you for service. Thanks. All right. From the air to the ground, uh, by way of helicopter, vertical insertion, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Steve Harris, and he's going to describe what he's wearing and take you down the timeline of the gentleman to his left, your right. You have the con. Thank you, Chip. Uh, good morning, everyone. Glad you could show up for Warbirds in Review. And uh, I'm going to start with myself here, moving from Ryan. Uh, I am doing a Huey helicopter pilot, um, kind of mid to late war. And the reason I say that, too, is the uh, uh, early on, the Army aviation uh, didn't have uh, suits specific for aviation for helicopters. So they actually used a uh, cotton U.S. Air Force K-2B. Uh, sometimes you'll see them actually wearing greens, but then later war two, they did come up with a two-piece Nomex, uh, and it is fire resistant. And the uh, flyers also used full leather boots. They wouldn't fly with combat boots. The nylon, if there was a fire on board, would melt, basically melt your feet off. So they did have full leather boots on as well. I, as Ryan, have a survival vest. But also, I would also have something in the, cock, uh, in the uh, cockpit for protection. So in this case, I have an XM-177E2 at my feet. But we also have Mark. Mark, if you'd change to the side, just turn to the side. The XM-177E2 is the carbine version of the M16, and that is circa 1968. So that is the short carbine version. On myself as well, I'm also wearing the chicken plate. And this is a ceramic plate, front and back, and this will stop a 30 caliber bullet. Uh, as the war progressed, too, they got upper armored seats, so I know some of the guys would either wear them or they would put them down in the bubble in the plexiglass for a little extra protection as well. I also have a 45 and a shoulder holster for protection, but a lot of times, if you saw the guys, sometimes they would have a pistol belt on here, and with the upper armored suite seats, they would swing it to the front for a little added extra protection. Uh, moving over here to uh, Sergeant Miller. Sergeant Miller has the XM-177E2. So uh, sergeants, NCOs, and officers would have gotten and received carbines. He does have his uh, 
infamous boonie hat on, but he does have his M1 Steel Pot helmet as well. And he has the 56 gear, 1956 gear, which is made of canvas. Later in the war, they went to an M1967 gear, which is made of nylon. The canvas would deteriorate in the uh, jungle uh, climates of Vietnam. If you would turn around, please. He has on his uh, bayonet and his butt pack. Uh, the butt pack, in many instances later in the war, especially, was also dropped. And, and also, you'll see the most common rucksack you probably see in the Vietnam War. Uh, we don't have one out here is the lightweight ruck. You'll see that in many photos. The troops, that's probably the most common rucksack that you'd see is the lightweight rucksack. Thank you, Mark. And Bob is wearing the greens as well. He has an M79 grenade launcher. They uh, started with that. It looks like a big shotgun. It, sh it uh, fires a 40 millimeter shell. Uh, and it was known as blooper or thumper because you can actually thump, hear that round go out, but you could also see that round go out, outbound. It's that slow. It's slow enough where you can see it go on the target. Uh, later in the war, and he does have an M16, so that would be the standard infantry rifle, and it has a 20-inch barrel and a solid stock. It does feed from a 20-round uh, box magazine. Special Forces would have received some 30 round magazines, they would have kept those and then gone to the standard 20s. Those were very rare. Um, to bring up and mate the two together, the M79 grenade launcher, the Grenadier, only had a 45 pistol and his Grenadier duties, the M79. Later in the war, they actually changed that and they came out with the M203, which was mounted underneath the barrel. So it gave the Grenadier not only his Grenadier duties, but it also gave him a standard infantry rifle for more. Uh, firepower in the squad. Bob is also wearing the steel pot helmet. He has his drive-on rag to keep him cool. He does have his flak vest on. The flak vest would not stop a bullet uh, per se, but obviously flak. So if it had any deflective uh, properties, then it would protect the, uh, the wearer. He also has on the green OG-107 uniform and the combat boots. Those are the uh, iconic combat boots. Uh, half leather and then half nylon. Uh, what would ha also have been in here would have been the tiger stripes. Special Forces would have worn tiger stripe pattern. Uh, I apologize, we don't have one here at the moment. Later in the war, we have the ERDL, Engineer Research Development Lab. This is kind of the predecessor to the woodland that you may be familiar with. And uh, Johnny over here has the M60 machine gun. He is of so smaller stature. My uncle was also of smaller stature and was the pig gunner. This was affectionately known as the pig. Comes in at about 23 pounds, four ounces. And this is what you wanted to protect it. Um, this M60 protected you, but you also wanted to protect him. This is the squad machine gun. Uh, every troop would carry bandoliers of ammunition to help feed this thing. He was a target. Your RTO, your radio telephone operator, was also a target, and of course your off officers. Obviously your officers demanding, uh, commanding the, uh, the flow. Your RTO, who's communicating with the fast movers or the airplanes or artillery, and of course your squad machine gun. Thank you, Johnny. Uh, I believe at this point we probably have some time to open it up to Q&A. Chip? All right, thank you, Steve. Jack? The wearer often forgets what he's wearing. I'm wearing an SPH-4 helmet which has the uh, avionics in, 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 the, in the ear bubbles here. Uh, and as Ryan, this also has the, uh, uh, the smoked visor as well. Why don't you turn around and uh, show them your, uh, your call sign on the back of your helmet, Steve. There you go. <laughs> All right, uh, how about a hand for these guys, putting on this gear and standing in the... Thank you. We appreciate that. Appreciate that. We have time for uh, Q&A, maybe one or two questions um, from the crowd. Do we have any questions? Please raise your hand, and I'll try to come over to you to go within ear range. We have one up here. Okay. Nice and loud. <laughs> oh, come down. Uh, Mobile. Could, could you expound on why the Army went to a two-piece flight suit versus the one-piece flight suit? Okay. I think we can do that. Did you catch that, Steve? Why did they go from a one-piece to a two-piece flight suit? 
primarily I believe it had to do with the uh, material. We went from the cotton to the fire resistant uh, uh, Nomex. I could also tell you from a current Air Force perspective, we currently wear uh, one piece and two piece flight suits. And the thing is, is if you have a one piece flight suit and if it's really hot outside and you want to take your top off and like uh, get a little cooler, can't really do that in a one-piece flight suit. Two-piece flight suit, you can take the top off, work around the aircraft when it's hot and muggy out, and then when you go fly, you put the top back on. Great. Okay, how are we doing on time? One more question? Okay, um, let's do one quick item of business first, and then back to Q&A here. Um, Steve, you want to introduce Matt and what he's wearing? Matt is doing an early Green Beret advisor. He does have on that Tiger uniform that I had mentioned. Um, in Vietnam, it is very long uh, from north to south. And there was, there's many different uh, climates, if you will. So you, see, you do see in different portions of the country different camouflage being used as well. He, as early, he also has an M2 carbine, which from the World War I M1 carbine, uh, was made fully automatic and had a banana magazine on it as well. There was a shorter magazine during, during World War II. So he's doing an early advisor impression. Thank you. And thank you, Matt. Uh, next question. All right. Going once. Going twice. So, oh, here we go. Yes. Okay. All right. The uh, kind of a two-parter there. Number one, maybe just a little bit of color around how the squad, et cetera, would uh, rally around and support the gunner. And was the, uh, the pig gunner, the M60 uh, honcho, always short in stature? So a two-parter for you there, Steve. So just maybe a couple sentences about how they'd rally around him, support him during a firefight. So they're, um, they would have the ammo to support him, he would have an AG, an assistant gunner. So that assistant gunner is carrying, um, they, that actually has a quick change barrel as well. The M60 is actually based on the German World War II MG42. Um, so the, the uh, kind of the pistol grip in the rear area is similar, and uh, the quick change barrel in particular. So the gunners would carry extra barrels, so the support would be there from uh, a squad and that squad would uh, protect that machine gunner. Uh, the ch second part, Chip? Were the pig gunners um, necessarily short in stature as a rule? Not all the time, but we're short Greeks, short stout Greeks, uh, in particular like my uncle. So um, he did get the M60 machine gunner. It wasn't always the smallest guy, but it, you know, the smallest guy, if they were very sturdy, uh, made for a smaller target. So we're talking running back and halfback build kind of guys here. All right, fantastic. All right. Um, those are some excellent questions, man. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else? I thought I saw a hand over on this side. Okay. Wow. We must have done a good job. Hey, uh, how about giving yourselves a hand for being a great audience, a uh, great attendant audience? Those are some great questions. I, I, I love doing this because we get new questions every year. Um, uh, quick show of hands. How many are uh, newbies? How many of this is your first year to air venture? All right. A lot of rookies in with the grizzled veterans. I love seeing that. Great seeing you. Please come back. Um, we'll be back uh, not this afternoon, but we'll be back tomorrow morning and Friday afternoon for our wrap of Warbirds in review. Uh, give yourself, a, again, another round of applause for being a great audience. Great questions. Uh, again, please come see us. Chip Berger, voice of the Warbirds Living History Group. Signing off. Have a great day, folks.